Aloha. This tradition of the Pacific Lecture is titled Voyagers of the Sky, presented by Dr. Robert Schallenberger. This lecture was recorded on December 12, 2013. Gathering on the mountains this evening in preparation for rain tomorrow, um, I sent greetings to, to all of us. Uh, mahalo for coming tonight to listen to renowned conservation biologist and wildlife photographer, Dr. Rob Schallenberger, as he gives an illuminating talk on our feathered friends and oceanic voyagers of the Hawaiian skies. Um, two dozen seabird species call Hawaii home while ranging widely across the Pacific Ocean and beyond. And these birds are finally adapted to the terrestrial, aquatic, and aerial environment. Um, Dr. Schallenberger is a conservation biologist who uses photography to convey his passion for the natural world. He received his doctorate from UCLA for his research on Hawaiian seabirds. He's had a long career as the refuge manager of what was then called the Hawaiian Islands National Wildlife Refuge, established in 1909 by Theodore Roosevelt's Executive Order 1019. The refuge covers the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, with the exception of Midway and Curie Atolls. He was refuge manager there for nearly 25 years, from 1980 to into this millennium and therefore counts as one of the people in the world that can be said to have long-standing and intimate familiarity with our Hawaiian seabirds. He also served as the chief of the entire refuge division of Fish and Wildlife Service in Washington, D.C. for seven years. I've long known and admired Rob as a colleague in conservation, and when he retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service, he joined our staff at the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii, where he helped establish our Hawaii Island program as its director. And 2011, he retired from TNC to devote more time to photography and seabird conservation. Um, and his photographs amassed over the years have appeared in many magazines and books. Most recently, his beautiful book, Na Manukai, Hawaiian Birds of the Sea, published by the University of Hawaii Press. And you might have noticed some outside on the table. And if you're lucky, perhaps Rob will sign some for you tonight. Um, and so without further ado, Dr. Rob Schallenberger. Thank you, Sam. Although I have to call to question um, the word renowned. I, I've been doing this for a long time, but nobody's ever called me renowned. That's like Bonnie and Clyde or something. Um, how about a little mood music? I probably should give this talk with this in the background because that's what it's like to be in a comedy. They don't stop for you to speak now. <laughs> you know, I've been talking about seabirds for years, but I always wanted to make it a multi-sensory experience, but I never figured out how to do that. Touch, you can do, you can... I guess I had to show this was sort of at the beginning of this career, and this is our latest. <laughs> I'm not sure what the change of the evolution reflects, but actually, my first experience with seabirds was fishing with my dad in San Francisco Bay and watching the pelicans. I think you all know that a wonderful bird is a pelican. His mouth holds more than his belly can. He can hold in a week enough. He can hold in his beak enough food for a week, and I don't know how the hell he can. <laughs> you know, I was talking about that the other day, and my wife heard it, and, you know, she said, this really is a lot like you approach everything having to do with wildlife. I wonder how the hell he can. I wonder if the hell he can. So I, I, it is a way to look at the natural world and one that, that has sort of governed my career from the very beginning. Speaking of career, I retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service in here. Last time I was here. Um, but as he said in his introduction, I really do want to look at things from an adaptation standpoint. If you ask the question, what's, what's the adaptive significance of something you see in the natural world, it takes you down a path of inquiry that's really important. And in the case of seabirds, you're talking about what, how do they adapt to the marine environment in which they feed? 
or the terrestrial environment in which they nest or the aerial environment in which they fly. And if they fall down in any one of these, they're out of luck. But you'll see that to accommodate this and to adapt to these different environments, you have to be able to find ways to compromise. And we'll talk about that as, as we go through this. There are over 300 species of seabirds in the, in the world. I think many of you have probably been to the Galapagos and seen the blue-footed boobies. It's probably the, the most popular of those. There are a number of things that seabirds have in common that, that I would call, that you might want to use if you're trying to determine if it's a, a good example of a seabird or a, a typical seabird. For the most part, they, they look alike. The truth is, I'm sure they can tell them the sexes apart, but for a lot of species, we can't very easily. And most of them engage in some kind of display, in this case, a breeding display. Most of them go through some period uh, when they arrive back at the colony of sort of breaking down defenses and trying to accommodate one another before they go through the process of laying an egg and raising a chick. And it happens to be an albatross of mutual preening behavior. Most of them lay one egg, uh, at least the Hawaiian seabirds, but in the case of the brown booby, sometimes, many times, they might lay two eggs, but rarely successfully raise them. Most are colonial. This is at Midway. How would you like to find your nest? This is early in the season, and it, I just, as an aside, I'll make a few cracks along the way about dealing with the military and other folks that have impacted these habitats, but this was a antenna field, and when we took it over as a refuge, the antennas disappeared. Most of the seabirds have some kind of mechanism for excreting this additional salt that they develop when they eat fish or they drink out of the uh, ocean. This happens to be a shot where I wasn't intending to do this, but caught this bird dripping it off and drips off the tip of the bill. And this is a very famous bird. How many have heard of wisdom? Good. A migratory bird biologist that I frankly used to work with when I was in Washington banded a bird in 1956. It subsequently banded him several times, her several times. She was rediscovered sort of with a, with a chick about six years ago, and she's had a chick every year since, and I'm happy to say she just laid last week. Um, 64 years old. It's the oldest living wild bird. Pretty impressive. What I'm going to do really quickly is kind of to get everybody up to speed in a general sort of way, run through these two dozen species of seabirds and just introduce it to them and, and get some sense of the diversity. That's what's amazing out of 23 species, actually. They have so much biological diversity. We can, sure. I said that too fast. I don't know that we can, but I hope we can. Louder? It's kind of crazy anyway. I feel like a quiz show. That work better? Yeah, but it's not doesn't seem much better than the other one. Can't get it any longer. We'll have to deal with that. Okay. So anyway, the first bird on the title was the black-footed albatross, a much more abundant laysan albatross. Midway is the largest albatross colony in the world. And at this point, there's at least 650,000 breeding pairs of laysan albatross. Um, the golden goonie, short-tailed albatross, a bird that Fish and Wildlife Service has been trying to attract to Midway to establish a colony. 
only less than 2,500 in the, in the world, most of those on a single island in Japan. My favorite bird, the wedge-tailed shearwater, uh, by far the most abundant burrowing bird, at least at this time, because the bone and petrol numbers are going up. Christmas shearwater, unlike the wedge-tailed, doesn't normally burrow deeply, will nest between rocks or under nalpaca. The newel shearwater, a threatened species, found primarily on Kauai, but uh, used to be quite abundant. Bulwer's petrel, uh, one of several of the different petrels. This one also nests in, in rocks and crevices. The bone and petrel, and I'm hoping this is going to be our real uh, winner, because the bird was depressed so badly by rats that were introduced to Midway, it, it simply couldn't survive, and the numbers plummeted. But they're going up just as fast now that the rats have been removed. Very similar looking bird that. Hawaiian petrel or dark rump petrel. An endangered bird, again, limited primarily to uh, Kauai and uh, the Big Island. Nests in upper elevations in the forest and in the Pohoihoi lava. Um, I have to tell you a, a bit of a story. I actually had an opportunity to go up on the Lanai Holly to try and catch some insects at night and laid out a big sheet with a Coleman lantern. We were picking moss and everything off of when a I didn't know it at the time. Hawaiian petrel flew into the sheet, knocked the sheet down, got all rolled up in it, and I went after it. Had no idea what kind of what bird it was. I didn't know if it was a bird, but it turned out to be my, the first Hawaiian petrel I had seen. This is uh, a band rump storm petrel, a little diminutive bird that's primarily on Kauai, on the higher elevation forest. If you notice the fuzz on the head, this is this is part of the story. Is these are birds that fly from their high elevation nest and uh, wind up being attracted and disturbed by lights around the perimeter of Kauai. So this is a downy bird still just having left its nest. This is the sooty storm petrel. This is a picture by Ian Jones that he loaned me. This, this bird's restricted, at least in the Hawaiian archipelago, to the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, with one exception right here. The second big order is the Charadriaformes, and this includes not only um, a number of the terns, but it includes a lot of shorebirds in it. But in Hawaii, and when we're just talking about seabirds, it includes the black knotty, the brown knotty, a little bit stockier bird, and the sooty tern, which is by far the most abundant in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, in, in the world for that matter. They're all over the Atlantic as well. But this bird, uh, in the northwestern Hawaiian Island, there are three million estimated uh, breeding adults, not to mention all the immatures as well. But a very similar bird, but not uh, nearly as abundant, is the grayback tern. It looks very much alike. And another small one, the blue-gray knotty, uh, a rock-nesting or cliff-nesting bird in relatively small numbers. And I think the most photogenic of them all, the white tern. It's hard enough to find a place to tuck up against your mommy, but when you've got to do it on a branch 50 feet in the air, it's another question. I, you may not know that the white tern, that there is the uh, bird of Honolulu, the official county, county bird. And I think it's because so many see them around Kapiolani Park and... Uh, and the legislature and so on. And when I asked Sam about the Hawaiian name of this bird, Manuoku, he sort of speculated on all sorts of reasons why it would be named the god of war. I mean, really. And I, I got to tell you, Sam, though, I found something the other day. It says he's also the god of government and politics. <laughs> and I think that's why they fly around the federal building all the time. The last of the three orders of Pelicaniformes of course, it includes pelicans, but not in Hawaii. Three species of boobies, the brown booby, the red-footed booby, a more abundant and a tree-nesting or shrub-nesting bird, and the mass booby, or blue-faced. And uh, this is a rock cliff kind of nesting bird. The frigate bird, the great frigate bird that's found in Hawaii is, is uh, throughout the chain. I, I'm quite sure many of you have seen them along the coastline or in the harbors. 
uh, trying to glean a meal out of a chase of another. You know, this is the male bird, and uh, we'll talk about the, the behavior a little bit more. Two kinds of tropic birds, the red-tailed tropic bird, by far the most abundant of the two, and the uh, white-tailed tropic bird, which is found... I'm going to say something about this in a minute. But the white tail is found at, uh, at Volcanoes National Park over Pololu Valley, um, along the whole Hamakua coast in small numbers. I want to catch this picture while I'm thinking about it. We'll be talking about flight in a few minutes. And this is a bird that's well adapted to flight. And you'll, the, the feet actually are positioned way back on the bird. So he walks around kind of like a tripod with the two feet and the belly. I mean, the breast. It's very inefficient on the ground, but a terrific flyer. You can see he also uses his whole tail structure as a rudder, in which it becomes a really important control. And, and then the white tailed tropic bird. A quick uh, few mentions about habitat, because it. And I want to, just as a caution, um, when I talk about habitat, I have to always remind myself that what we're looking at is a point in time. How many birds are using which area and which kind of area at the time? Has this been this way forever, or is it an artifact of a period in which some populations went up and some went down, or habitat was changed by human uh, activity? So what we know about habitat and the distribution of birds is an artifact of what's going on right, right now. And some of those, like the Hawaiian petrel and the Newell shear water and so on, nest in these high elevation habitats on Kauai and some of the other islands. This is over in Haleakala Crater, a Hawaiian petrel nesting colony that the Park Service has been monitoring for many years. This is Mo'omombi Dunes on the northwest shore of, of Molokai. And I put it in here because it's... Uh, probably a pretty good example of what a lot of the coastal areas look like before they have been converted for other purposes, both pre-contact conversion to agriculture and post-activity. It's a great place for shearwaters, a really nice property. This is Kilauea Point. It illustrates two things, another shoreline nesting area for several species, but also an island that provides habitat free of predators. There's 50 of these islands that range in size quite a bit throughout the main group of islands in Hawaii. And they're all, to one degree or another, very important for seabirds, like Molokini or Manana uh, or Mokomano or the ones you're familiar with. If you start to move out the chain um, beyond Niihau, you, I'll just whip through these fairly quickly, but to illustrate the habitat within, now keep in mind, at this point in time, more than 90% of the birds in the Hawaiian archipelago nest on less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the land. That's six, about six and a half square miles of 6,400 square miles of the state. So again, I mean, a lot of that's obviously not suitable habitat, but, but put it in perspective. The first island as you move out is Nihoa. And this one is particularly interesting because of the diversity of seabirds that are there, but also some land birds uh, that are unique to the island. Neckers, that, or Mokumanamana, is the next one up the chain, quite a bit smaller, about the third the size, and rockier with very little vegetation. The first atoll in your ride up to the north is uh, French Frigate Shoals. It's about 20 miles across has about a dozen small sandy islands on it and one pinnacle called La Perouse. Laysan, where most of the stories of the history of the, of the refuge are born, uh, about nearly a 1,000 acres with a central lagoon. Used to be the, uh, I'll talk about this a little later, but the idea, this is where the Laysan duck is found naturally. Lysiansky, quite a bit smaller, actually used to have its own central lagoon now it's primarily a nesting area for the albatross species. This is one of the islands of the five islands at uh, Pearl and Hermes Reef. Again, very similar to, to French frigate, you know, a variety of shallow or narrow habitat. And the infamous Midway. Midway has three uh, islands that total about 1,500 acres. 
the atoll itself is about five miles across. Um, and this is where most of the data have been coming from seabird work for quite a long period of time. It's been occupied by humans since 1903, and potentially before that, but at least the ones we know about. Here's what Midway looks like if you're in the shuttle. And an older picture, I don't have a new picture of Curie, uh, but this does have in the background, you can see the tip of the Loran Tower. This is the Coast Guard made the runway to maintain a Loran station out there for several years, and uh, that shut down. So very quickly, I, I would point out that if you're interested in managing seabirds, you can't do it in a vacuum. You need to be thinking about what's going on in the variety of other wildlife that share that habitat. Sometimes there's potential conflict, sometimes they uh, facilitate it. This is the Nihoa miller bird, one of those birds restricted to here, at least until a few were transplanted to Laysan Island. The Laysan duck, um, this is an interesting one because the fossil record shows it on, on almost every island in the chain, at least the high islands. And yet, there's, it's all from fossils. Nobody has any records. This bird has been transplanted to Midway, where we've constructed a number of freshwater seeps and other sources of food, and it's doing quite well. Of course, lots of cetacean populations up there, but predominantly spinner dolphins and the iconic monk seal. Uh, this is a, a sad story in itself because it continues to diminish in numbers in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands while the numbers in the main islands seem to be increasing a little bit. Most of the green sea turtles that in the main Hawaiian Islands originate from East Island at French Frigate Shoals. But you can see because there's birds up on the crest that there's a potential for conflict uh, between nesting birds and nesting turtles. You think you have big sharks up had to throw that in. Let me just take a couple of minutes to talk about flight. You know, somebody told me the other day that it, all, for all wildlife that want to sustain populations, all they need to do is eat and make babies. I mean, that's really the objective. But they got to be able to fly. At least most of them have to be able to fly. If you're a penguin, you might not have to. If you're a flightless cormorant in the Galapagos, you don't have to because you can find all the food in the water right in front of you. But if you have to fly, and particularly if you have to go long distances for food, uh, you have to have ways to conserve energy. And one of the, the most spectacular that I've, I've seen is the way albatross are able to fly by utilizing these very long and skinny wings. An engineer would call that a high aspect ratio wing, which means the ratio between the length of the wing and the cord or the depth of the wing. But they also have a muscular structure that allows them to essentially lock their wings in, in a position that allows them to fly effectively through a process called dynamic soaring, where they depend on the wave action and the wind action to be able to gather, dive down, pick up lift, turn that lift into speed, come up the other side of the swell. So if you're trying to, if you watch an albatross at sea and to a lesser extent a turn, or a shearwater, and you wonder why they're going like this, kind of a circuitous route to get to the place they're really headed. It's because they can save energy and they can go forever without flapping. Not forever, but for quite a way. If the water, the wind quits, then you'll see birds that have to manipulate their wings and take advantage of the lift. The compromise I mentioned has to do with landing and flying slow. And anybody who's been in an albatross colony has gotten a kick out of watching the birds come into land. And uh, it's all because this high aspect ratio wing does good at speed, but it doesn't do anything when it's flying slow. And so, you know, for an albatross trying to find it, it's one thing to find your nest, it's another thing to land next to it. So there's a lot of wandering going on in an albatross colony. In contrast, the frigate birds, they have a relatively similar wing, but it's much lighter. The bones are much lighter and much porous, and they seem to be able to soar in like a hawk would soar in a good thermal or in a constant breeze. 
the Necker Island Nadi is light enough that it can actually just hover without flapping in, a, in the updraft of the wind, trade winds hitting the cliffs. But here's the Arabat of all. Uh, and here again, I show you that he's turned that rudder into a, a very effective tool. Okay, so they get there. Now they gotta eat. And here comes one of those questions again. What's the adaptive advantage of eating this food over that food or flying a thousand miles instead of a hundred? It all really has to do with how do they partition the resource. I love that word, partition. How do they divide up the food? It's really what it means. And it, it's, it's through a various means of catching food, different times of day, different times of year, different types of food, and so on. The albatross, it has to do mostly with sitting on the water when you see debris and, or what looks like fish eggs or squid and pecking away at it until you fill your bill and head home. But if you're a thousand miles away, by the time you get home, it's turned to soup. And a lot of these tube-nosed birds have produced a stomach oil that's uh, really a residue from their food and pass it directly to the chicks. And if you haven't seen this, you'd be amazed how much they can do without dropping a drip. On the other hand, sooty terns and shearwaters, for the most part, will feed over fish schools. And how, how many of you ever been trolling or offshore fishing and seen the fish work where you have tuna and uh, aku and ahi and stuff just blasting through? They can come in and hover over it or sit on the water and just pick this food up as, as it's forced to the surface. They would be useless without the dependency on the fish. The boobies, and to a lesser degree, the tropic birds are plunge divers, and they can... I'm sure you've seen the video primarily from uh, Galapagos and them 100 feet in the air, tuck their wings, dive down, go 50 feet underwater, chasing fish. It's pretty impressive. As I said, the tropic birds do this to a lesser extent. This is a bone and petrel at night. They're nocturnal like many of the other petrels, and they'll come in at night. But when they go to feed, uh, they can feed on the surface, pecking at food, but they can also feed on this ant nightly migration of plankton and other organisms from the depth that comes up to the surface. Or if you're an ashy petrel or a, a band rump petrel, uh, you can literally walk on the surface tension and pick food off. This, this, by the way, is why they call them petrels of St. Peter. Black knotty is a bird you can regularly see almost year-round in, in the main islands, and uh, it feeds fairly close to shore, but it also nests in, uh, in the rocky cliff spaces. Grayback tern is one of three or four birds often referred to as Neuston feeders. And the Neuston is that boundary layer at the surface of the water where plankton and other organisms gather and they can pick it off and make it part of their diet. So you've got at least five or six different kinds of feeding strategy, many of which are, take place at different places in relation to, to their nesting area. So they're able to divide this up. Here's a, another strategy that only this bird does and everybody knows about Manu Eva, the thief. They actually do feed. I've seen them feed at sea many times. Uh, and actually, they look like they're drinking, too, when they'll, they'll fly and they'll dip the bill. But the one you hear about is uh, the ones who hang around the colony all day long waiting for the boobies and tropic birds and shearwaters to come back with their gullets full and then chase them until they, they uh, throw up. And they either catch it in the air or wait till it gets to the, to the bottom or to the surface of the water. Here we go again. Uh, this, uh, this is one of those how to do it questions I've always asked. This is one of the few seabirds that catches its food and doesn't swallow it and regurgitate it. I and mean, he feeds it directly to the chicks. As I mentioned, they were hanging over the fish schools, grabbing this fish. After you get the first one, how do you get the second one without the first one falling out? I mean, it's, it's really kind of hard to figure.
And one thing you'll notice, I don't know that there's been any serious studies of this, but my anecdotal view of it is that the adults have a good idea of how big their chicks are. Because I, I don't recall ever seeing them bringing a big fish into a little chick, but sometimes you do see big fish in big chick. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's true, but it'd be worth finding out. Um, this is actually more than a silly picture of my wife. Uh, how many have been to Midway? Wow, it's great. I think if you spend any time at Midway or in a colony like that, you get, you, you ponder the idea of intervening. You know, you, you see so much death and so much oh, birds just suffering so badly that oh, nobody's going to care if I squirt them with a hose and cool them down. Or, well, in this particular case, um, an ironwood tree fell over in a strong wind. And there were a number of black noddies and white turned chicks in it. And we've watched enough in the past to know that the adults don't seem to be able to find their chicks once they've left their, their branch. But um, so we picked up about a dozen chicks that were going to die anyway and brought them home. And my wife put them on a branch in front of the house, got some of the local guys to go out and catch fish every day, little Nehu and... And so she fed them for about two months. And most of them figured it out. When they could fly and they don't want to be around anymore, they take off. But she had one that was a little more persistent and followed her for about two or three weeks. She'd walk down the road. They'd just, you'd just fly right after her. Anyway, I, the bigger story is the intervention story, and we'll, I'll mention that again. Okay, good stuff. Now that's the other half of making babies. Uh, we call it courtship or pair bonding or, frankly, just getting to know. Which, in, Since these birds are largely monogamous and they not, do not appear to be associated with each other at sea, they have to come back to their nest, nest site, which is generally very close to where they nested the previous year, or, frankly, where they had hatched three or four years before. Uh, but they have to sort of break down this initial territorial thing and, and of course fly over the colony and see if you can find your nest the challenge begins and if you've looked at the seen the behavior this is really uh, something to watch and uh, I'm going to put the well let's just see if we got one here I used to ride my unicycle from my house to the office, and I thought all that clapping was for me. <laughs> but then it stopped. And then... So what you'll see is a lot of postures that for the most part seem to derive from some sort of natural maintenance behavior, a defensive behavior, or picking up a stick, preening, stretching, you know, one wing or the other. So you'll see them in the sky point display. This is the, the bills hitting each other. Um, this is a wing tuck. This is interesting because the lace and albatross seem more often to tuck over the top of the wing, and the uh, black-footed albatross often tuck on the bottom. So if you're a black-footed albatross... Yeah, here's a uniquely black foot where the wings are kind of folded funny and stuck out, and they're, you can't really tell from that picture, but the heads are over each, the necks are over each other. Now, all of this 
dancing and all of his sort of different dancing is all about avoiding hybridization. Because as in most animals, hybridization results in sterile products. So, but occasionally it screws up and they'll, they'll get one like this and he'll walk around trying to figure out who I'm supposed to be displaying with. And to my knowledge, we've never uh, seen a hybrid nesting, but could be. I mean, things happen. Probably wouldn't be successful, but. So back to the mutual preening. Uh, we've broken down the barriers. We're ready uh, to produce an egg. And uh, I have to say, when it's this time of year, Albatross have nothing on their mind but getting laid. I mean, literally. And it's dangerous to walk around or ride your bike or whatever because they're hell-bent for finding their mates. Crazy time. Now, here's something special. This picture has a lot of meaning for me. We'll talk about the attempts to try and recover the golden goonie or the short-tailed albatross. But in, in this was in 1999, where we had had records where laying infertile eggs or just standing around doing nothing for a whole season and flying away. This particular one, pair were about 200 yards apart near the east end of the runway, and they were each individually displaying at every laysan or blackfoot that had walked by. And it was getting, frankly, frustrating, and it was my turn to intervene. So I picked up one of them and carried it over and put him next to the other one. Big deal, you know. Well, I hid in the bushes, and about 20 minutes later, they walked up to each other and started dancing. You'll love the guys. Uh. <laughs> We didn't know what to expect. I mean, this was just... Anyway, I stayed in the bushes till it got dark, went back to the house, came back first light in the morning, and they were back in their other places. Now, if I tried to do that nowadays, I'd probably be arrested for Endangered Species Act violations. But, but it was worth a try, in my opinion, and uh, it was fun. Bone and Island petrels come in after dark, uh, but when all the courtship activities of the Bonans is quite a trip. Um, by the way, this is a audience participation part of the talk. So if you feel the urge to moan or make noise. <laughs> but I, I love this bird. This great frigate birds and boobies. And, uh, the males will find a site they like to nest on, usually on the top of Nalpaca. Like they'd walk in a room like this and there'd be vegetation about as high as all of you. And there'd be a male frigate about every 20 feet bringing nest material into himself and, and uh, starting to build a nest. Well, boy, let a female fly over. It gets... Uh, now, this really is... If, if you feel too embarrassed, we can turn the lights down. Great. My pouch is bigger than yours. I mean, this is really what this is all about. Love it. Okay, we made it. Now, some are more subtle than others. The uh, noddies, and that's N-O-D-D-Y, not N-A-U-G-H-T-Y. The noddies nod. That's about it. They do it a lot of times, but that's about it. Well, you already heard the terns. The interesting thing about the terns, though, particularly when they're so abundant, is that they, uh, there's a whole concept called social facilitation. And it's that the, the stim part of the stimulus is what's going on around you, all the calling, all the jumping around, all the behavior. And to the, ex 
in the places this has been measured, it determines that they can synchronize their nesting, the peak of their nesting production more effectively because of the social facilitation than independent of it. Um, and then also if you're in an area where, now it probably doesn't matter too much about synchrony here because you're in the tropics or subtropics, but if you're nesting in the tundra in Alaska and you only got a window of a little bit of weather and you want to get, it, get up there, lay that egg, do the whole thing, get home. The territory of a sooty tern when they're nesting is about as far as they can peck when they're sitting on an egg. So it gives you some idea about the density of birds and what it means to be a... Now, here's my favorite bird, and if nobody moans, that'll be a problem. Now, pay attention to this. If you look at this picture, the one on the left, the throat is a little bit inflated. This is one of the few birds that makes a sound on inhalation. So the first call you'll hear the <laughs> is exhalation, and then <laughs> and then it go again. So Imagine what it would be like to be shipwrecked on Lake Sand Island <laughs> in the middle of the day, just when you think you got it together, you're on dry land and whatever. 30,000. Now, here, actually, this is not typical of courtship, this is more territorial boundary stuff. You know, I, I was interested in this communication stuff enough that I, I went into the literature, including the popular literature, to find some descriptions of what it was like to be in Shearwater Colony. I wrote a couple of those down. I, could, I would get them wrong if I tried to. A bedlam of weird screams, wild howling and crying of insane spirits. <laughs> a series of gaspy, wheezing cries resembling the escape of steam through a partially clogged pipe. Does that fit? A deafening concert of witches burning at the stake. <laughs> anyway, you can see why. Maybe you can see why I enjoy this. This is a... Uh, Christmas shearwaters, and I said the Christmas shearwaters don't burrow as much as wedge tails, and they're not as common. But they have a very distinctive three-part call. Let's see if you can hear. All th There's two birds calling, so it, you have to tease it out. <laughs> only heard two birds and you can always already recognize them you know the difference in calling and that's hard to tease out when you're trying to do it scientifically but but we know these birds can recognize each other by their call we know the shearwaters can recognize their chicks from their burrows so there's whether in some species it's vocal in some species it's much more visual but if you're a nocturnal bird it's not easy to be visual about this the other thing that Christmas shearwaters do is call in flight. And I, I don't know enough about them to know why four birds were flying at the same time. Maybe it was three males and a female. I don't know. But one of them was calling in flight. Here's, a, again, the red-tailed tropic bird. This bird has to, when it comes down to its nest, which may be a hole in the vegetation, it has to flutter down to the nest site. Um, but the epitome of display for tropic birds is a display that's totally dependent on their flight ability. If you look at the... These two tropic birds are engaged in a 
courtship display that involves flying backwards. And I'm sure if those who have been to Midway have seen this, and there's certain parts of the island, pretty much every island where the tropic birds live will go to do this behavior, so it's pretty predictable. But they also... I've got it here. This is two birds calling one. Now here, again, this most photogenic bird, um, you think, well, maybe they don't make a lot of noise. They just... Keep it quiet, and individually they don't. But when you've got 40 or 50 of them nesting on your windowsills, and they're on a different time scale, they wake up at four. And so they're ready to make babies too, and we'll, we'll make the shift now to uh, discussing about egg laying and incubation, because that's obviously the next objective. Um, just like birds have to divide up their feeding habitat, they have to divide up their nesting habitat. And it really varies a lot between the species. But again, remember the caution I gave you right at the beginning. It, you're, you're looking at a point in time when trying to understand where birds are nesting. There could be, and almost certainly are, birds doing things that aren't typical of that family or that, that bird in other locations, just as a function of where they're at. This is a grayback turn. No nest site, just lay the egg on the gravel. This is, you don't see this a lot, but sometimes the albatross will build nests and they keep building them each year. And you've seen this with raptor nests, with hawks and eagles that will continue to build it up. Uh, and sometimes they do this, frankly, because it's raining so hard that they're in likely to be flooded, and they'll actually build up their nest while they're sitting on it. It's pretty impressive. White terns will nest anywhere. Uh, I used to caution people at Midway, don't park your bike more than a couple hours, <laughs> because if a bird lays an egg on it, we're gonna, that bike's going to stay there for the rest of the season. So, so on water faucets, on on uh, shelves, on bikes, on, they're all over the place. But their natural nest is in a tree and in a, on branches. And here's the adaptive advantage of, of being able to do, to nest, to lay your egg on and successfully brood or incubate it on a branch, is that you take up a habitat that nobody else can do. I took this picture because I wondered why the poop went in 360 degrees. <laughs> Yeah, was this a changing wind pattern, or, <laughs> or the board got the bird got bored and he wanted a new view? Um, sometimes we see this condominium effect, um, and this is just two birds with shearwaters nesting in a burrow under a brown knotty's nest on the top. But I've literally seen it in situations where you have wedge tails in the ground, Christmas shearwaters on the ground under the bush a tropic bird under the same bush, uh, halfway up a bunch of black knotties nesting, then a frigate bird and a booby on the top. And it's all reflective of how you can divide up the habitat. I mentioned uh, the brown booby lays two eggs, usually two eggs, but either expels the egg or the, or the second chick at some point, and they never, never seem to raise more than one. Bullwars petrels like the rocks, but sometimes they find nesting habitat in the shell holes from the military training activities that took place over the years. Brown nowadays love rocky slopes on, on islands with no vegetation, but it seems like if they find a place that has it, they'll use it. And here's an anomaly. Here's a black knotty nesting in an ironwood tree that was planted by humans in the 20s. So, yeah, that's cool. If unless the, what was there before the ironwoods went in was better habitat for another species. You find yourself make, literally making decisions about where, where these birds can be in order to accommodate this diversity. 
Only a mother could love, right? This is an albatross chick uh, coming out of an egg uh, with the help of the adult. And uh, this is very often, actually, you can actually hear the birds calling inside the egg, particularly if it's been pipped and starting to get ready to come out. But the very close brooding of the chicks during the first three or four weeks uh, and bringing food back regularly. Eventually, they're pretty much on their own, and you can, in the middle of the day, you can look at the colony and see nothing but brown bumps, which is the chicks that have grown up. Um, I, I found that I was photographing these chicks getting ready to fledge because they had these funny hairdos. So I put out a help wanted or a most wanted poster. They're really a kick, but this is the stage in which they're getting ready to fledge. You see, every time a rain squall comes through the island, they all stand up and flap their wings, practicing flight by bouncing in the same area. Um, unfortunately, it's one of the problems at Midway is that these birds, when they, that when the adults or when they get big enough and leave the nest site, they walk to the closest ocean or lagoon, which often means across a runway at Midway. So we would have to actually go out there with a flatbed truck before the planes came in and pick up a bunch of birds, take them over where they're headed anyway, but put them on the other side of the runway so they don't run out in front of the planes. What well, we've seen this one, but. This is an interesting bird because the chicks, um, in order to be able to do this successfully, have to be able to sit pretty tight for several weeks. And they, unlike many of the turn species, they have very little webbing in the, between their claws. And I, I just imagine, I've never seen them actually hatch, but can you see an egg sitting on a three inch branch trying to hatch? I imagine the egg going out through the side. <laughs> Hold on to three hands. Anyway, it's, I've never seen it, but I, it would be cool to watch. Aren't they cute? One of the issues that the sooty terns usually have to deal with more than others because they're w right out in the open with no cover is the temperature. And Occasionally, it can be a cold temperature problem, particularly on Midway in the winter when it's 45 degrees and it's blowing 30 knots and raining. But for the most part, it has to do with thermoregulation in a very hot climate. So they have to provide shade. And it's even more trouble for the pelicaniforms, particularly the boobies that are hatched with no down at all in there. Essentially, have to be brooded very closely but it isn't very long before they're as big or bigger than the adult. Same with the mass booby. A lot of rotation with one bird going out to catch food and so on. And once they're old enough they don't need to be brooded, then the, both the adults are out. The red-tailed tropic bird has these little fluffy down chicks that uh, are very aggressive. Now, I want to make a couple comments about um, cultural connection. After all, this is a Voyager's lecture series. Um, and this is, a lot of what I'm going to say is open to debate. Because obviously when we're dealing with a thousand years ago and trying to figure out what was here and in what way did pre-contact where, where the birds affected and as opposed to post-contact, and I've seen some neat stuff that Sam's been putting, Sam Gunn's been pulling together about settlement patterns and the difference in, you know, the Polyne in, in the Hawaiian period and what's happened since Captain Cook. But we do know, we can infer a lot by what we find. Um, many of the island groups in Eastern Polynesia and, and even in Micronesia share birds, bird species, diversity with Hawaii. It was, they're not perfect matches, and in some cases they're, they're a little bit different, but like the Marquesas have about half the same species. And the ones they don't have are species that are very similar, sort of fill the same niche. And so I don't think there's any doubt that anybody who was a voyager ultimately reaching the Hawaiian Islands would have already had experience wherever the heck he came from. 
I mean, realistically, there was a lot of dependence on seabirds in, in colonies throughout the Pacific. And so uh, that makes it hard to talk about what, how different it is today within the absence of data. The good news is I've um, been able to collect quite a bit of fossil evidence of what species, at least in the main islands, were it did, it found on islands that aren't found on today. And there are a good number of them. So they disappeared. They show up in the middens of um, early Hawaiians that, that were cooking petrels, for example, and you find a, uh, a lava tube that would have a pile of bones in it, and half of them were burnt or cracked from having been cooked. And usually they were shearwaters. But frankly, we don't have enough of a fossil record in terms of diversity of sites to be able to say what other ones might have been included. And this presents an interesting anomaly. This is Nihoa from a different angle than the earlier picture with all the house structures and temple sites and other important structures on an island with a half million birds on it. And so, I mean, it's, I think it's ludicrous to say they didn't need these birds, they didn't use these birds, and, uh, and that's where the debate comes in. Some of the f fossils, uh, this is a, a rendering of the uh, flightless goose. The goose stood about three and a half feet tall. It may, it was abundant enough, it may have actually functioned as a, the grazing animal for Hawaii before there were sheep and goats. These are petrol bones. Um, one other thing that's a bit uh, up for grabs in terms of discussion is, it, is the role that seabirds might play in aiding navigation for voyagers. And you can find a lot of speculation, but not, uh, not a lot of substance on that question. The people who have been doing the voyaging will tell you, if you see certain species at the right time of year, you can infer that maybe you can see, if you can see it 10 miles away, you can probably know it's there 20 miles away or 30 miles away. If you've been out on a boat fishing around Midway, you could always tell you where you come home 10, up to 10 miles away from the color of the underside of the clouds because the lagoons were turquoise and they reflected off the clouds. So the Hawaiians had a, a combination of tools here. You know, they would pay attention to certainly to the movement of patterns of swells, to the wind, to the, I'm told that there's ways of discerning when the waves work their way around the islands, how that changes their patterns. Um, the sun, the moon, there have been experiments by taking albatross from Midway and taking them to Seattle and releasing them and, and seeing different behavior on cloudy days and on sunny days. You know, there's, again, a, a number of sort of inferences. I think it's probably true that the experienced Voyager would plug this in with every other potential cue and say this is how they find their islands. Um, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but seabirds, we, we hear a lot about the feather capes and so on of the small forest birds, but frankly I've learned a lot over the last couple of years about the Kahili, these ceremonial staffs that are lined at the top with feathers from various birds. And uh, these are red-tailed tropic bird plumes, those long skinny things sticking out. But what's kind of spooky is to see them with the mamo and e uh, oo and some of the rarest of the forest birds mixed in with seabirds, which presumably can withstand quite a bit of uh, impact compared to those forest birds. If you haven't seen the exhibit here, the Kahili Room, in the next building, you should. It's terrific. The last thing I want to mention about this sort of relationship between people and seabirds is this, the story of the Hawaiian petrel. Uh, you may not be aware that the, uh, in Tasmania and New Zealand, and to a lesser degree in Australia, they have been mark managing seabird population, mostly short-tailed shearwaters and sooty shearwaters, for annual harvest, and private landowners have agreements to take only a certain portion of the birds each year. 
it's probably not a heck of a lot different than must have happened with dark rump petrels because they were birds for the elite. There were special people with training to be able to catch these birds. Uh, and they actually stuck sticks down the burrows or the crevices and pulled them out with bird lime. And you might wonder why you'd want to eat one of these things, but, but they're fat and sassy. They actually get heavier than the adults, and the adults will leave, and the weight goes down, and then they'll leave their burrows. But they, there's some evidence in the Pohoi areas of Mauna Loa that they've actually removed what was a cover over the nest chamber itself and could take the chick out and then put the thing back. Next year it would nest successfully and they might not take that one or they'd take another one. Okay, just we'll kind of wrap up with a quick discussion about the conservation challenges, some of which are presented by natural phenomena that obviously we can't do much about, like sharks about the time that the sure what are the Albatross chicks are leaving the island. Like wind and rain, we think albatross need wind, yeah, but there is too much of a good thing. And if it's like this for weeks at a time, what's it do for feeding of chicks? And, uh, overheating, as I mentioned, if the adults leave, then the chicks readily overheat or they're vulnerable to, to predators if, if they're on islands with rats or other predators. Um, they're very, very persistent when, when their nest gets flooded. And she's obviously sitting on an egg that won't hatch, but she'll sit on it for quite a long time. Or disease. Uh, in this case, avian pox. It's kind of disgusting when you see it, but fortunately, most of the birds seem to grow out of it by the time they get older. But this, this is not truly natural because in this case, it happens to be a house fly that's transmitting the the uh, disease. Um, there's a sort of a litany of challenges for seabirds in the Hawaiian archipelago, and I'll just mention a few of those. And But I also want to stress where I think, and I, you may agree, things are being done or have been done that really improve the, the outlook. Starting from the legal and illegal harvest in the turn of the 19th century, on Laysan Island where they collected eggs for fertilizer and feathers for everything they could use feathers for. Fortunately, that led to the uh, designation of the Hawaiian Island Reservation that Sam mentioned and ultimately became the Hawaiian Islands National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the military in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands had a colored history. This is actually on the Battle of Midway. I can date it. It's June 4th, 19. 42. Um, we always kind of speculated about this picture, you know, and I made the comment about it. Were, were there any birds on Midway, any that would have seen the battle? And that wisdom is pretty close to it. I think we figured he went down, to, he could, he was 53 or 56, I can't remember. But it's quite possible that these are chicks that grew up and came back and may still be with us. The military used a number of the islands for bombing targets. This is a crater left from a non or 500-pound bomb. Sometimes different things happen. You know. And they all cheer when the military left. But <laughs> The biggest scare in the Northwestern Wine Islands for all of us who have had management responsibility, of course, is, is groundings because of the potential for oil and rats and and uh, there have been a history of grounding. And we also don't have a clue how many birds are getting oiled away from the islands, oiled, you know, where, where it's fatal. The problem is they ingest the oil when they're trying to preen and it becomes toxic. Um, I invited Linda Elliott, who's an animal rehabber out to, to, to uh, Midway to help us prepare for oil spills and to clean up birds that we found from that sort of inauspicious beginning, now we have the Hawaii Wildlife Center, which is the newest and fanciest rehab facility in the islands now. And uh, this was constructed out on Javi on the Big Island. 
Net debris is an issue for all the wildlife out there. We don't have a real good idea of how serious it is for seabirds. Um, and we presume that given the total population that they can withstand it better, obviously, than monk seals or turtles. This was just an accumulated pile of net debris. The conflicts have gone on with, about drift fishing and to a lesser degree, or to a greater degree in this case, for longline fishing. There have, it's, it's a fairly complex story, but essentially there have been a, some really good strides lately to come up with alternative ways of laying the hooks out so that they're not so lethal. Of course, rats. And that's something to think about when you're trying to compare the, the Polynesian period and the post-contact is that they brought with them Polynesian rats and pigs and dogs. Eliminating the rats at Midway and Curie was a, a huge success after a lot of work, a lot of poisoning. Uh, but the population of petrels and other ground nesters are just rebelling. In the park next door at Hawaii Volcanoes, that's good, everybody's head turned sideways. Um, they have petrels nesting and they have a problem with mongoose and cats. And uh, very hard to deal with. And then you've heard in the Newell Shearwater on Kauai for now over 30 years, they've been running a program called Save Our Shearwaters to rescue birds that are leaving their nesting colonies in the higher elevations who are disoriented by lights and uh, otherwise might perish. I find it interesting that we're talking about these birds being disoriented by light when the Hawaiians use torches on the shoreline to attract them. Sometimes these adaptations get you in trouble in other pursuits. And lead poisoning, those of you who have been on Midway know clearly about this, but this is an issue specific to that site because of the lead-based paint that was used on all the Navy buildings. It's all being contained under contract now, and, and we hope to see this thing disappear completely. Invasive weeds, um, mustard, uh, golden crown beard, and other plants can take over an island uh, just very rapidly. The trouble with this, can you can get a whole crop of birds ready to come down and lay eggs and breed, I mean breed, lay their eggs, raise their chicks, but before they're able to successfully fledge the chicks, the vegetation comes in so thick that they can't even get out of it. And the chicks overheat in the absence of wind. So it's something you have to... The, the good news is all 100% of the acreage on Eastern Island at Midway has now been treated, and they're hitting at gangbusters on uh, Sand Island. Death by plastic. Uh, I don't even... I, I can't imagine that... Anybody hasn't read about this or heard about this lately, but the, the really challenging part of this is, is trying to gather data to understand what's the consequences to the bird populations. I mean, I've heard, I hear a lot of stuff in the news and so on. It's kind of, this is just destroying the species. And it, and it may be having a more serious effect. It looks like it's, it's so terrible to see this all over the island. But uh, the real issue is whether it's impacting productivity as a species and what will happen over time if it continues. Because it's a global issue to fix. It's not something we can fix in Hawaii. In terms of establishing protected areas, and I call attention to the certainly the biggest additional marine protection in forever was the Papahanaumokuake Marine National Monument at 140,000 square miles. But there's a lot of smaller stories. Um, the acquisition of Kilauea Point from the Coast Guard by the Fish and Wildlife Service, and look what's happening there now. Um, the Freeman Preserve on Black Point, a, a small but productive and probably as, as valuable as an educational tool as it is as a biological tool. Uh, or the predator-free fence at, uh, at Kaina Point. All these kind of small th wins add up to big successes, I really believe. One of the things that I've noticed, I, when I did my shearwater work in the late 60s, early 70s, I was walking around with a flashlight and a red filter on it, you know, trying to disturb the birds as least I could. What's been fascinating to me over the last 15 years, I would say, 
is a technology that has developed and now been co-opted for seabird research. Uh, the radar, the, the, uh, the, abil the traps that reset themselves, the, the remote cameras, the acoustic monitors, all these different tools are being used to learn good things about uh, species in trouble. And I think it's really important to do it. However, don't lose sight of the things that we've been doing for 100 years that still need to do, the at-sea observation, the banding of birds, the, the uh, capture for measurements and tracking. This is uh, bone and petrels, and the only way we can catch these in numbers is with a mist net that's normally used for birds. And I'll mention briefly the whole translocation and movement of birds. Um, this colony of, that's starting to grow of short-tailed shearwater, a uh, short-tailed albatross at Midway owes its success largely to the attraction techniques using dummies like this as well as recorded sounds of the birds. Uh, and it's working. I mean, it's not in big numbers yet, but it looks like it was the tool that was necessary to get that going. Um, I threw this in to remind me about climate change. How can, you can't walk out of a room without talking about climate change, in the, particularly in the northwestern islands where there's only a couple of basaltic islands and most of the rest are less than 15 feet high, some lower than that. And the French Rigged Shoals where this was taken, we've already seen islands disappear and new ones move. And so very little sea level rise can have significant effects. But so can the acidification and the temperature changes and the storm frequency and all those other things we don't fully have a handle on. And lastly, those of you who were able to, I'm delighted to see so many hands go up when I mentioned Midway, is, is I at least and some of the people who are still in the Fish and Wildlife Service doing this feel very strongly about the visitor program and, and uh, how important it is to the people understanding about nature in general, but how to contribute to the correction of these problems. So we're trying. Uh, we have an organization that I'm on the board of, the Friends of Midway Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, and any of you that are interested in following the progress of Midway issues and contributing some time or interest in, in the project, we'd sure like to hear from you. Friendsofmidway.com. All about kids. I'm glad you're here tonight. But it's going to take a lot more than just one kid at a lecture to make a difference in it. How can you, how can you resist? Thank you. Uh, it it's, can be pretty prevalent, but it's, as I said, the chicks seem to grow out of it. Not all of them, but it's been my experience they grow out of it. Yeah. What's the black and white albatross? The goonie bird or the albatross, yeah. That is, and, and Kilauea Point is a terrific place to be. And how's the predation on the wobbles compared to Kauai? Because there's both monkeys in Kauai. And it's not a cat when you mention the wobbles. How it is. Well, it depends on what species you're talking about, but up in the forest. Yeah. Well, I'm actually a little surprised that Black Point's done as well as it has so quickly. Um, it's like, like the problem with monk seals and sharks. That in, individual rats or cats in particular seem to target. And, and Kilauea Point has a history of dog predation where they come in and kill a bunch of birds but then don't eat them. So I, I, I think predation for these birds is, is really the most, most serious immediate issue. 
Yes. How did how do they do that? Actually, you can dissect the underside of the wing, and you can just see where the muscles hold it up against the bone. I'm not a physiologist, but I've had it explained to me how it actually works. It's not a total lock. It's just it takes the variability out of the flapping and allows them to... It's like more like a glider than any... Okay? Well, Thank you. Mahalo for listening. If you have any questions or comments on this or other online audio programs, please visit us online at www.bishopmuseum.org. If you like us on Facebook, you'll be alerted when new programs are available. Ahui ho from the Bishop Museum.